Okay, we're gonna get started. Good evening. <clears throat> On behalf of MCC and the friends of McHenry County College Foundation, welcome to MCC, and welcome to the second night of our Expert and Insight Speaker Series, Marshall Fields and Chicago. This is another fantastic crowd for our second evening, and we are so happy you decided to join us tonight. My name is Brian DeBona, and I'm the Executive Director of the Friends of McHenry County College Foundation. The foundation here at the college worked with our community to build financial support for our students, primarily through scholarships. But one of the other things we do is build financial support for programs that will inspire both our students and our community. And this is the perfect example of one of those programs. So we are thrilled to be able to provide financial support for tonight's event. As an employee here at MCC, I am thrilled every day to be able to witness the extraordinary talent we have in our faculty and be able to walk the halls and hear that talent inspiring students. Um, so one of the purposes of this event is to expose our community to the incredible faculty we have here at MCC and allow you to be inspired by our faculty as well. So for tonight, I'm just gonna ask you for a couple things. Sit back, relax, and enjoy what's going to be a phenomenal presentation. Um, and if you have a great time, I'm gonna ask that you share that with friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, and share the good news and invite them back to additional uh, speaker series, sp speakers that we're going to have. Um, I'm gonna throw in a third plug. If you're really moved, and it's because of my job, we'd love a donation to the college. So you can go to, to our uh, college website, look up the foundation. There's a real easy give button there that you can make a donation to the foundation. So with that, it is now my pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, I can honestly say I look forward to speaking with this woman every time I run into her. I know I'm going to walk away inspired and I'm going to be better for that conversation. I'm going to know more. Every time I'm with Sarah, I learn something. Sarah Sullivan is an instructor of history at MCC. She has taught both history and business at MCC for over 22 years and was MCC's faculty of the year in 2016. In addition to teaching, Sarah serves as department chair of history, political science, and economics, and, also, and is also co-president of MCC's faculty association. If that's not enough, Sarah is currently serving as a Rhodes Scholar with the Illinois Humanities Organization, and she speaks frequently and publicly on a variety of topics that focus on Abraham Lincoln, Alexander Hamilton, women in the colonial periods, Henry VIII, and the founding generation. Uh, I'm gonna quote Sarah here. I hope to inspire students to think of history as evolving and important. Our personal history explains why we are here and where we are, and larger historical events show how the, county, how the country evolves. Sarah holds graduate degrees in American history, management, and human resources, and she loves nothing more than weaving history, a history story into one, maybe two, or possibly every conversation. So it is my honor and privilege to give you our speaker for the evening, Sarah Sullivan. Hello, let's see, is this on? It is on. Thank you very much for being here today. I am very excited to share this um, information about Marshall Fields with you. Let's start off with um, the big question. How many of you still have Marshall Fields merchandise? Okay, raise your hands high, yeah. <laughs> a bag, a, sh a shopping, like a, like a, a credit card, a, a box, maybe ornaments. We all have something from Marshall Fields, don't we? We have that in common. Um, Marshall Fields means a lot to the people of Chicago. Clearly Macy's didn't understand that, but we know that Marshall, <laughs> you know, Marshall Fields meant a lot to us. So I wanna start this presentation by talking a little bit about what we historians do. So my first slide here is a postcard. And normally I show the postcard, but I realized that was going to be kind of dumb in this audience because most of you couldn't see it. So I thought I will just take a picture of it and put it up there. So this is a postcard um, that was sent in 1910. It is a postcard of Marshall Fields. 
Now, as a historian, I can get a couple bits of information from this postcard. Um, number one, how many of you have recently sent a postcard from Target or Carson's, <laughs> Kohl's? Anybody sending out Kohl's postcards? Um, Right, so that's the first thing we can gather is obviously it, it meant something to have this particular postcard. Um, sending it meant something. Um, you can also actually see some interesting details about the Marshall Fields building from this postcard. For example, in the days before electricity, when they had gas lighting, gas was not a great way to light a store. So you can see how the building is not all made at the same time, and you can see fire escapes on the upper floors. Obviously, those had to go somewhere. You don't just have a fire escape and then it stops. I mean, hopefully, because that would not be helpful in a fire. So um, there are actually, in this version of the building, um, there are many skylights and little ante areas to allow light into the building. So it was not, this, this building was not all one um, big monolithic space. It was a bunch of little spaces kind of put together over a period of time. In renovations that change, but in this version, that's another thing that you can see in this postcard. So there's a few other things we can determine from this postcard. Here's the back. Um, we know that Ms. Ada Bothwell, Boswell um, received this postcard in 1910. So we know that this postcard is almost 110 years old. That is older than all of us, isn't it? Um, so that is an old postcard. Um, there's no, no zip codes back then. Um, but the other thing we can determine from this is um, the value of Marshall Fields. We can see that from this postcard. So first of all, the fact that somebody chose to send a Marshall Fields postcard, a postcard of a store, says something about the value of the store. Also, that postcard being sent in 1910, we can probably assume that Ms. Ada Boswell is probably not alive anymore, right? Do we, you know, unfortunately, she's probably passed on. We didn't even know her, and she's already gone. Um, but what we can determine from that is that somebody else, she must have thought this postcard was valuable to hold on to it, but somebody else kept the postcard after she died. That's how much it mattered to someone else, that they kept a postcard. Think about all this stuff. When people die, you just throw all their junk out because it's junk to you. This was something that obviously her family, friends, someone thought, oh, this matters. I'm going to hold on to that. Um, and quite possibly, it had more to do with the picture than it did the message on the back, which I still can't read. I've tried a couple times. Um, obviously, I didn't learn this version of cursive. Um, but it also says some other things. Um, I came in contact with this postcard when I bought it on eBay. So obviously, someone thought this postcard was valuable enough to sell it on eBay, and someone else decided it was worth $1.25 plus shipping um, <laughs> and made a deal on eBay and bought this postcard. So the postcard tells us a little bit about Marshall Fields, but we already know this because, again, you're all here tonight, and how many of you brought Marshall Fields stuff with you? How many of you brought, like, a ba Okay, just Noelle, really? Okay. Normally when I do these programs, I have, like, 35, 40 people that are all like, look at my thing. Um, because we're all so excited about it. I did actually get somebody um, gave me some Marshall Fields merchandise that I'm not going to share with you because it's too cool. Um, but um, we have Marshall Fields things. We care about Marshall Fields. We value Marshall Fields. So let's talk a little bit more about the store. Marshall Fields started as a wholesaler, um, as most stores did. Women did not shop in the earliest periods um, in American history for a lot of reasons. First of all, it was disgusting out there. You know, long dress, cows, horses, dogs, pigs in the street, no sidewalks. It was dirty and messy. So women did not shop outside. Ladies stayed home. They bought things from catalogs. That's where wholesale came in. Shopping was not yet a social sport. Um, and because people were so spread out, people were still not really living in cities. Even by 1860, they were starting to move into cities, but that wasn't where most people were. So um, you would have purchase things either through a catalog or perhaps a traveling salesman much more um, realistically than you would have bought things in a store. And this idea that we have of you know, going shopping for the day just didn't quite exist yet. So in the earliest period, in 1867, Field and Lighter, and oh my goodness, Lighter? Where did he come from? So originally, um, there were several different iterations of Marshall Fields. Marshall Fields and Levi Lighter bought out Potter Palmer. You probably know the Palmer House Hilton. Um, they bought out P 
Potter Palmer, and they started their retail business using a lot of his merchandise and um, using his connections. Potter Palmer ended up marrying a 19-year-old, and he decided to kind of change his focus in life and ended up selling real estate. So for him, it was a good deal. And for Field and Leiter, it was as well. So Marshall Field and Levi Leiter go into business in, 19, or in 1867. If you see the, the difference there between their retail earnings and their wholesale earnings, gosh, which business would you rather be investing in? Wholesale, oh, yeah. That doesn't take, it doesn't take a business instructor to catch that, does it? Um, and then we move to 1872. You can see their retail dollars are going up pretty dramatically, but they're still making that much more in wholesale. Wholesale is still where it's at, even by 1872. And let's remember, 1872 is around the time that we have the Great Chicago Fire. Um, people are still starting to spill into the city, but it's still not quite as large as it's going to be. So. Um, the fact that Marshall Fields had this wholesale business that was really strong and robust allowed them to start to sell retail as well. That's where the difference was made. And it was made for a couple reasons. First of all, when you have the wholesale, you get to keep your prices low. You can decide what to mark up and what to mark down. Also, you can decide how much to charge your, your competitors when they want to buy the stuff that you sell wholesale. That's kind of convenient too, isn't it? Um, so, and you have economy of scale. If you are buying a lot of something, you can buy it for less cost than someone else could. So Marshall Fields made the decision to sell their domestic products at a loss and to mark up the foreign goods because they were really one of the only places that could provide those foreign goods and people were happy to pay them. Um, I put this ad in, in this slide very purposefully um, because it, it just, it kind of makes me laugh because if you can read this, you see that, um, these corsets fit all ages from infants to adults. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you put your infants in corsets, but you should have. Um, and in addition to that, in this period, men wore corsets too. Everybody wore a corset. That was what just kept you together. So, you know, kind of like Spanx today, right guys? That's how we do it today. So um, anyway, I thought that was kind of a fun picture to, to show everyone. So Marshall Fields, by 1890, they had what we consider a comprehensive product mix. They had expensive products, they had inexpensive products, they had um, wholesale, they had retail. You could buy almost anything you wanted except a car at Marshall Fields. So they had this mix of products that really met customers' needs. Um, by the 1890s, shopping had started to become a social event. This is the kind of um, shopping that, we, that we, consider, we think of when we think about like ladies who lunch. This is the moment where ladies who lunch start to show up and start to, to go out and shop. Um, so because we have that, suddenly the stores have to change a little bit. We're also starting to see ready-to-wear. If you can imagine, the earliest days of Marshall Fields, even the retail establishment, they sold much more fabric and sewing kind of needles and thread and things than they, sew, than they sold ready-to-wear finished goods. How many of us would be naked right now if we had to sew our own clothes? <laughs> I always think that I would have one outfit and it would be very crooked. It just wouldn't look good at all. Um, but that's how it went. So back then you were just buying fabric. So it, not quite as much fun to go for the day and shop when you're just buying fabric. Um, so now suddenly people can buy things that are actually finished or maybe mostly finished. There might be some tailoring to be done, but things that are mostly finished. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the other things that happened um, in the 1890s, Marshall Fields was one of the first places in Chicago to offer women a bathroom. Ladies, think about how important that is when you go out. Don't you care? Like, if you don't have a bathroom, how long can you stay out? Not that long, right? Um, and Marshall Fields was smart. They, they, they realized that the longer they keep you in the store, the more you're going to buy. Giving you a, a little place to flush is, is really a smart idea. Um, and they also started doing restaurants, which, of course, helps with the bathroom, too. That's nice when those go together. So they started to create Marshall Fields as a place where people could go and have many needs met instead of just going to buy a gift or, or buy a pretty new thing. Marshall Fields became a, a destination where you could actually spend the day. 
Um, the image I have here, this is just great. So back in the day, you did not go like you do today to Macy's and pick 15 things off the rack and bring them in the dressing room that has other people's stuff in it um, and try your clothes on. Back in the day, the way shopping happened, and it's depicted here, if you notice there's chairs, there's a lot of chairs, um, and there's very few outfits. So the reason why that was the case is because models would actually model the clothing for you. That was how Lucille Ball got her start, actually. She was a fit model. She looked a lot like a woman um, who had a lot of money and, and wanted to buy clothes often. So Lucille would be the one who would, who would put the clothes on and, and come out and do the modeling um, to help this woman decide what she wanted to buy. So if you were a fancy woman, you didn't want to get all sweaty and you know have to wrestle with clothing. Someone else did that for you. Um, so again, the stores were structured in a very different way than they are for us today. There were the um, ante areas where all the storage was. That, was. that was a bigger chunk of the store than what we see today because you only had one or two of each item out on the sales floor. Everything else was in the back and people would bring it out to you. So there was much more service involved um, versus what we're used to today. So um, Marshall Fields was a place to see and be seen. Um, this image is just great. It really gives you a sense of, of perspective. So women would have, would have hung out in those balcony areas um, so people could see them in their beautiful outfits. And so they could also check out who else was out there. You know, you have to know what your competition is. Um, so this store structure allowed for people to see and be seen. It was also incredibly beautiful, that ceiling. That is a Tiffany mosaic. It is the largest Tiffany mosaic ceiling still in the world. Um, I have some close-up pictures for you because it is just that beautiful. I strongly encourage you, um, now that it's Macy's, just go into Macy's, the Washington Street entrance, lay on the floor in the, in the perfume area, and just look. <laughs> Nobody's there now anyway. It's fine. Um, just lay there and look up at the ceiling because it is gorgeous. It is amazing. I've tried to take pictures with my camera, and I can't do it justice because it, is just, it glitters. It's beautiful. So here's one shot of it. Here's a little more of a close-up. So you can just see the level of detail. I mean, can, like, wow, right? It's just incredible. And then here's another shot. It's really pretty. Um, if you get a chance, feel free to go on. Google knows everything. Just ask Google to see these um, on your computer. Blowing them up made them a little less um, clear than I would like, but just beautiful. Um, so in addition to shopping, Marshall Fields created all sorts of other opportunities for people to spend the day. One of the things that they set up were women's and men's lounges. So I don't know about you, but I don't always go to Kohl's as a place to handle all my social business. You know, That's not where I'm going to send out invitations and write correspondence to people and read the newspaper. That just doesn't happen. Um, but at Marshall Fields, that would have. So this is part, and notice the picture says a portion of the women's waiting room. <laughs> so that isn't even the whole thing. Um, the, the space was designed for, um, for, again, for women to write, for women to read. They would actually pay your postage. If you had letters to send, they would give you stamps. They would give you um, paper and, and pens to write that, um, to write things. They would um, provide newspapers and magazines for you to read while you were there. Um, it was a place for you to rest when you got tired of watching other people try clothes on for you. Um, you might need to rest from that. So it was a place you could go and rest. It was also a destination. If you were a lady of some social status, you didn't want to leave the store before you had visited the lounge. That was just a place that you went. Um, and Marshall Fields became the kind of place where you would go all day. Um, there were, there were valets to park your car if you came with the car, um, and they would, um, they would escort you in the building. You could spend the whole day there, do a little shopping. They'd ship your packages home. You don't even have to carry them. You can have lunch there. In the afternoons, they often scheduled um, fashion shows or cooking demonstrations, things like that. So you could get the kids to school, come to Marshall Fields, hang out for a while, and then get home before the kids got home from school. How perfect is that? Um, there was a period of time where they even offered a nursery for little kids. 
Wow, they really wanted people to shop, didn't they? Um, they? They would take care of your children while you were out shopping. And it says something that people were very happy to send their kids to the Marshall Fields daycare to be able to, um, to, be able to hang out. Um, I don't know that I would trust the Coles daycare with my kids. <laughs> and my kids are 18. <laughs> So here's another image. Again, Marshall Fields dedicated a lot of space to, to things other than shopping, things other than buying products. So this is one of the restaurants. Doesn't that just look gorgeous? I wish we could eat there right now. Um, and here's another one. This is another, um, another vision of the reading, writing, and restrooms. I think this one is the men's um, restroom. They don't say that, but I think that's what that is. Um, so again, just a beautiful space. You could imagine hanging out there all day, letting somebody bring you frangos and you know, <laughs> try stuff on for you. Um, another um, restaurant, this is um, the tea room. So again, a beautiful space. Um, makes perfect sense why people would want to be there. Here's another, we've got the grill room. There were at one time six different restaurants in the Marshall Field State Street store. Six different restaurants, um, all with, with different um, focuses, different menus, different prices. Um, so you had a lot of options when you came to Marshall Fields and you could, you could do a whole week at Marshall Fields and not eat in the same restaurant. How wonderful is that? That's so cool. I know, why do we have jobs? <laughs> so in 1914, Marshall Fields was actually the largest department store in the world. In the world. How's that? I'm surprising, huh? Um, the State Street store covered an entire city block by 1914. It didn't start off that way. Marshall Fields um, ended up buying pieces of the building, pieces of the, the real estate over time. But by 1914, they owned the entire block. They also owned, um, it was 35 acres of retail space and 65 display windows. How amazing is that? 65 display windows. Um, they had their own transit stop. Marshall Fields was not, a, he was not a dumb man. So he was um, on the board of the Chicago Transit Authority. And when it came time to do the transit stop um, over there on State Street, he was like, well, you know, you know. So you had to get off on the second floor of Marshall Fields if you wanted to get off on State Street. How convenient is that for Marshall Fields? Um, Carson's and some of the other retailers were not entirely happy about that, but that's the way it went. The, it had to stop somewhere, so I guess Marshall Fields is the place. In addition to that, they offer long-distance telephone services. For us today, we don't care so much about that because we all carry a long-distance phone book and ability to call in our pocket. Um, but back in the day, you remember maybe when you were a kid or even 30 years ago or, or whenever, like if you made a wrong you called the wrong number long distance and you'd have to call the operator and ask to reverse the charges because it was so expensive. Long distance was, was a really valuable commodity in the earliest days and Marshall Fields was a place you could go to place a call. Um, many people didn't have access to a phone in their home so the ability to make that call was really valuable. Marshall Fields also stocked all the phone books. Like, and I say all, not just all the phone books for Illinois or Chicago, but they stocked all the phone books. So almost every place in the country, you could actually look up a phone number in the phone book. When's the last time we did that? It's been a while, right? But if you wanted to, you could have done that 100 years ago at Marshall Fields. Um, they also had a post office and a telegraph office. We don't send many telegraphs anymore. But if we did, Marshall Fields would be the place. Um, stenography service, a travel agency. They had a concierge right there. And then this is my favorite. Uh, they really went out of their way to provide customer service and meet people's needs. So I know some of you can read, you already know what's coming. Um, but there was at least one incident where a man and his wife were divorced and he had to pay alimony. He just didn't want to deal with her and she didn't want to deal with him. So Marshall Fields was a neutral place. He could bring the check to Marshall Fields. And how convenient for her. It's right there where she's gonna spend it anyway. That's perfect, isn't it? It just makes life easier. And I will tell you, I worked at Marshall Fields for a couple of years, and that's what I did too. Um, they would give me my check, and I would sign it right back over to them, and that's how it went pretty much every time. I don't think I, I think it cost me more than I made at Marshall Fields. I don't think I ever made a dime. Um, I have some nice stuff, but I didn't make any money. Um, so 
give the lady what she wants is a phrase that Marshall Fields is credited with having come up with. Is it true? It's hard sometimes in history to be sure what's true and what's just like an urban legend, something that we've told often enough. Um, but Marshall Fields did definitely believe in customer service at a time when customer service was not so customary or servicey. Um, in 1913, Henry Ford um, came up with this line, you can have any color model T you want as long as it's black. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not so much about meeting anyone's needs, just, you know, hey, this is what we've got. Well, Marshall Fields was different. Um, so they did a couple things. They played the long game when it came to customer service, which was revolutionary. They were not just about making today's sale. They were about making you a customer for life. And the fact that they had this immense product mix and they had inexpensive products and very, very expensive products meant that they could meet everybody's needs. Anyone in Chicago could shop at Marshall Fields. And anyone could be treated in that, in that wonderful way that Marshall Fields had of treating people. And it made people feel good. It made people want to go back. So that was one of the things that they did. In addition, they took returns at a time when people didn't take returns. Um, and if you can imagine, we can probably imagine today, when you buy something online and you get it and it's not what you thought it would be, you're like, I thought that was a medium. Um, or, or it's not the color you want or whatever the problem is. If you can't return it, that's not good. So Marshall Fields was very, very willing to take returns. When I worked at Marshall Fields, I worked in the men's sportswear department, um, which is funny because they put my fiance, soon to be husband, in the China department. <laughs> so, and it really made me mad because then he was all having opinions about which kind of China pattern we're getting and I did not like that at all. That, that was my job. Um, but anyway, um, and he had all these women I thought were so old, they were like 50 or something, and they would, you know, and they, they would like dote on him and it was just horrible because, yeah, he got a big head. But um, anyway, um, when I worked in the men's sportswear department, people would bring things back four or five years later, definitely worn, and I had to, re I had to take it back and smile and give them their money back. I mean, that's like it was that good. People took advantage of it definitely, but it gave people a sense of confidence that you knew if you bought a product at Marshall Fields, it was going to be a good quality product. Some other things that Marshall Fields did that were important, um, they didn't misrepresent their products. This was a time where people would tell you all sorts of stuff. Like for example, um, if you have looked at any of the medicine that was available in this period, you know, this will cure everything. Anything that could possibly be wrong with you, just drink this. It's got so much booze in it, you won't care anymore. Um, so misrepresenting products was commonplace. Marshall Fields said, no, we're not misrepresenting anything. We're going to tell people the truth about what it is. Also, we're going to tell them what the price is, and that's the price. We're not haggling. At that time, most stores were all about the haggle. And ladies, you'll probably agree, haggling is not fun for us. We don't like that. It's uncomfortable. You know, do you feel like you got a good deal? Do you feel like you've been gypped? How much should you pay? It's a lot of pressure. We don't like that. Men kind of are like, yeah, let's do it, but not women. And um, so when Marshall Fields went to this, the price is the price, it made women feel much more comfortable about shopping, particularly shopping without having a man along. So prior to that, you kind of felt like you had to bring an escort with you when you went shopping. Um, so they advertised in fashionable magazines. They helped women to know what fashionable clothing they should be wearing. Um, they did a lot of things to help, um, to help people choose to buy things in their store. And all of the strategies that they used ended up paying off for Marshall Fields for years, which is why 15 years after the store closed, we're still here talking about it. And we're a little sad, aren't we? <laughs> So Marshall Fields led the way in a lot of areas. Now, this is a bit tricky because who got there first? You know, it, 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 there are a couple of these claims where two or three places claim they're the first, but Marshall Fields was either the first or among the first for each of these things. They were the first to use lavish window displays. Prior to this, windows in stores were only used for one purpose, and that was to let light in. They were oftentimes really dirty. Um, so again, it was just so you could see what you were buying. There was no display of any sort. Marshall Fields was one of the first in the country to use displays. Now, interestingly enough, the first mannequins that they used were wax. Now, think about a summer day in Chicago, and that's what happened. So they stopped that pretty quickly because they just kind of melted. <laughs> Can you imagine being a kid? Like, oh my gosh! 
Um, so they, they went to different mannequins, but they, they did the store displays. They were one of the first to do that. Um, they had a sales office in Europe. That was a really big deal because that's where all the fashion was. And you had to have that European office if you wanted to be able to provide the latest fashion. So Marshall Fields was the first department store in America to have a European sales office. That was a big deal. Um, bridal registry. How many of us registered um, at Marshall Fields for your wedding? Okay. Yeah. So Marshall Fields was one of the first stores in the country to offer a bridal registry. And isn't that smart? Because if everything's at that store, where are you going to go to buy whatever you're buying for that person? You're going to that store. How smart is that? Um, they came up with the phrase bargain basement. That was a, um, a Selfridge idea. He came up with this, this vision of the bargain basement as a place where even people without a lot of money could go and shop and people who wanted to bargain hunt. So he was the one who came up with that. So if you've ever heard bargain basement, you know that's a Selfridge idea. Um, he was, they, were among, they were the first to offer a dining room. They were the first to offer suburban branches. The escalator, they started the escalators in um, right around the Chicago World's Fair in 1934. Um, and people went to the fair and then they came to Marshall Fields and rode the escalator. <laughs> what did they enjoy more? Eh, the store. <laughs> in addition to that, they were among the first to offer revolving credit. Now Marshall Fields was funny. They did not engage in credit um, as a business. They were a cash only business, which meant in the 19th century particularly, there were quite a few depressions and recessions. About every 20 years, the economy would sort of tank. Marshall Fields rode through all of that without any problem because they bought everything with cash. And they had extra cash so they could buy more of things when the price dropped during a recession and they were always fine. Um, but they really liked when their customers used credit because that meant you would buy more stuff. Yay. So they were among the first to do that. Um, personal shopping, a couple of you even talked earlier um, before we started, we're chatting about personal shopping and how great that was. Um, same day <coughs> delivery. Remember those, those green trucks that would come out to your house and you would know, well think about it. I remember even when I worked at Fields um, in the 90s, I can remember some people coming and buying 30, 40 packages for family members. And how nice it was for them, not nice for me, but nice for them because then it would be my job to schlep them to the back to, to have them delivered. Um, but how convenient. People buy more when they don't have to carry it, right? If you don't believe that, go to the grocery store and know you have to carry it in the house. You know you don't buy as much then. Um, so people were much more eager to buy when they didn't have to bring it home, especially in days before people had cars. So the average package delivery was 95,000 packages a day. Wow. I know. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? I know. It's almost Amazon, not quite. Um, the other thing that they did that's pretty smart, who would have ever thought, um, there was a time where men sold your unmentionables, ladies. Do you want to go to a man to buy your bras and underwear? Men, do you want to sell that stuff? No, we don't want that. So they were, they were really one of the first to go, you know what, we should hire ladies to do this. Wouldn't that be smart? Um, another thing that Marshall Fields did is they were one of the first stores to take the products out from behind the cases. In the earliest days of, of shopping, retail, everything was behind glass and you could look at it but you couldn't touch it. And, and Marshall Fields said, let them touch it. It's okay. What if they have dirty hands? It's okay. Let them touch it. When people touch things, they're more likely to buy it. So it, he, he did a lot of those kind of things that were really clever and definitely improved his bottom line. Um, he was a pioneer in book signings. Um, in the 1950s, Marshall Fields actually was the largest book retailer in the world. Wow. So um, they had book signings. People like Shirley Temple and Amelia Earhart came and signed books. Um, this is a great story. This is Judy the Elephant. And Judy the Elephant actually came and did a book signing in 1944 at Marshall Fields. Um, you can see she didn't actually sign like her name, but she had a stamper that she would stamp the books with. How cool is that, right? Now, Judy the Elephant, just so you know, didn't actually write the book. Um, but, but 
people were excited that maybe she did. So um, they brought an elephant from Lincoln Park Zoo to do, to do these book signings. How cool is that? They brought this, this elephant up to the third floor. They did the book signing, brought it up in the, in the freight elevator. How terrific. Well, at the end of the day, the elephant was not interested in getting back into the freight elevator. No, thank you. Did not like the freight elevator. So now what are they going to do? Because now they've got an elephant trapped on the third floor of Marshall Fields. <laughs> And it's closing time. How do they handle that? So they actually, there's a great um, website. Pepper Construction has got, um, they've got some information about this and some other photos as well because they, Marshall Fields called in Pepper to come in and to build a two-story ramp um, complete with some kind of spikes or, or, or texture or something because, you know, you can't just have an elephant go like that and have it turn out okay. So they came up with, with footholds and all of that to get the elephant out. So this, this elephant had to walk down the two flights worth of stairs on a ramp to get him out, to get her out of the building. I, know, I don't know about the poop part. I'm not sure how that went. But um, I imagine that was a tense day. But how cool to have an elephant in the store. Um, we don't see that happen very often anymore. Um, so Marshall Fields, by the mid-20th century, they provided incredible services. They made hats on site. They had jewelry and watch repair. They had an optical workroom. You could get your film developed there. Remember when you got film developed? You could go there and get your film developed. Um, they would make your stationery. They would make your drapes. Um, you could get your china repaired. Does anybody use your china? Somebody just today was talking to me about using my china, which I did about 19 years ago for the last time. Um, but if I break anything, I don't know where to get it repaired anymore. They would repair lamps. They had picture frame um, repair. They had, um, they had personal shopping, both on-site and remote. There were people who would actually contact Marshall Fields once a season to buy them their whole wardrobe for the season, people who lived out of town. And Marshall Fields would do the personal shopping and send it all there. Um, there were... There are some great stories of, of some men who just didn't know what to buy their wives. That doesn't happen anymore, does it? Um, but there were some men who didn't know what to buy their wives who would sometimes just talk to the valet. You know, hey, Bernie, can you handle this for me? And Bernie would talk to the, the personal shoppers, and then the guy would swing back in the afternoon, and here would be, the, here would be here, this is what your wife wants. Right. And it was usually right. <laughs> so really impressive how that happened. Um, the restaurants, um, the Walnut Room at one time was the largest restaurant in Chicago. And let's remember, um, when the Walnut Room first became a restaurant, there were no restaurants. The only places to eat were saloons. And ladies, we did not go to saloons. So this was a real big deal. It was the largest restaurant in Chicago at one time, 5,000 people per day. The largest day's um, servings was over 13,000 people in one day. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of chicken pot pie and frango cake, isn't it? That's a lot. Um, so they, they really served in volume, which is very much impressive. Um, the Walnut Room, the story behind that starts like this. So true or not, this was a Gordon Selfridge thing. And Gordon Selfridge, if you've seen the Selfridge um, series on PBS, then you know. If you don't know, he was the most flamboyant man. He and Marshall Fields didn't always get along because Selfridge thought he was the one that saved everything, and Marshall Fields was not playing that game. Gordon Selfridge was the only one who ever asked for a partnership for Marshall Fields, and Fields was so offended, he almost couldn't even speak. Um, but Gordon Selfridge had some great ideas. He was a self-promoter. He was also a guy who lived with his mom even after he was married, um, and the wife was not happy about that. Um, so he was an interesting character. But um, this, the, the story goes like this, that there was a woman in a department selling to a, a group of ladies who were there at, 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 let's say, 11.30. And their tummies are starting to get a little rumbly, and they're thinking they want lunch. So they were like, you know what, we're just we're gonna have to pack it in for today because we don't have time for this, and um, we'll we'll come back another time and finish buying because we're hungry. And there wasn't any place to eat, so they were just gonna go home. So the salesperson said, Oh no no no, don't do that. I will share my lunch with you. And being that they were in Marshall Field, she was able to get the fancy tablecloth and the china and the the you know the silverware and all that stuff. And she put together this this very nice meal sharing. Um, her grandmother's chicken pot pie. 
That's Mrs. Herring's chicken pot pie. So that is the origin story. True or false? I don't know, but that is the origin story of the chicken pot pie. Now I do wonder, because there were a couple women there and this was just this one salesperson's lunch, so I, I start thinking, you know, the, the fish and loaves kind of thing. Like how did you have enough to serve all these people? Were, were they really tiny bites? I mean, they were wearing corsets, maybe they couldn't eat a lot, I'm not sure. But, um, but this was the story. And then as the story goes, these women came back again and they were like, you got any more of that chicken pot pie? Um, and Gordon Selfridge noticed and he's like, you know, we got something here, we need to open a restaurant. True or not, they did open a restaurant and it ended up being, as, as you saw, very, very successful. Um, in addition to that, they started doing the, the Christmas tree. It's a 45 foot tree. In the very earliest days, the Christmas tree was real. And um, Marshall Fields had three different fires. We'll talk about those in a couple minutes. So fire was a big deal for Marshall Fields. They were concerned about, about preventing fires. So initially, they actually hired somebody to watch the tree overnight. Can you imagine that job? Just sit there and watch the tree and make sure it doesn't, doesn't catch on fire. Um, and if it does, do something. So um, <laughs> eventually, they decided to make it a, um, they decided to make it an artificial tree, so they didn't have to have that worry. Marshall Fields also hired dogs in the 1960s to work as security guards in the evenings, um, and that did not work out either. They discovered that the issue they had is then whenever workmen were in the building, the dogs would not let the workmen work. They would spend the whole night you know, trying to bite them and eat them, and that didn't work either. So they've learned a lot of things as time has gone on. Um, the 28 shop was the most elaborate place to buy things at Marshall Fields. Um, it was named for the entrance at 21 East or 28 East Washington. It was um, it was a place where the, the elevator went directly just to this couture boutique, um, and they had the most expensive, most elaborate, most um, exotic clothing there for women. So um, they opened in 1941. The dressing rooms were designed by the set designer for Gone with the Wind, so you can imagine how elaborate there were. Um, there were 14 different designs. They had two of each dressing room, so 28 rooms all together. Again, the ladies did not try anything on. You can see that, that in this picture here, you've got women showing, the, the, the woman sitting down, showing her the clothing. And then up here, you've got a maid in a maid's uniform pouring tea. That does not happen at Kohl's, does it? Uh, so you, you can see just the level of service that one would have received at the 28 shop. Has anyone ever bought anything at the 28 shop? Okay, oh, okay. Now I know who to borrow money from. Um, <laughs> it was a very elaborate, um, very, very specialized sort of location. And it was needed for Marshall Fields to compete. There was a time where Marshall Fields was competing very successfully with East Coast and West Coast um, department stores. So having that kind of service available was really essential. Um, Marshall Fields has several other buildings in addition to, well they did, they don't anymore, um, but they had several other buildings in addition to the State Street store and the suburban locations. Um, they eventually bought the entire block of State, Wabash, Washington, and Randolph. That was where their main store was. Right across the street, they had an annex for men. Um, the story in that is that John G. Shedd, he was the second president of Marshall Fields after Marshall Fields retired. Um, he was, he's like, you know what, we gotta get these um, cigar smoking men out of the main store because they are wrecking it. Um, we just, we can't have them in here anymore. So they're like, you know what, let's build, let's build a man cave across the street and just let the men go over there. And so they did, and they set up a space for men with men's clothing and sporting goods and all sorts of things specifically for men. So then the main location of Marshall Fields could be targeted a little bit more to women. Um, there was actually a tunnel underneath. There were several floors of tunnels underneath the building, but you could get back and forth with the tunnel. You didn't even have to go on the street. Um, in addition to that, they had a seven-story wholesale building. That was on Adams, Quincy, Wells, and Franklin. They built the Merchandise Mart. Um, sadly, they finished it in 1931. Why was that not a good time to finish a building that was 4.1 million square feet? Any guesses? 
Yes, the Great Depression. Womp, womp. So that was bad. Marshall Fields obviously was, was, they took quite a loss on that building. They eventually ended up selling it to Joseph P. Kennedy, and it remained in the Kennedy family for quite a long time. It's only recently been sold. So um, they, that was going to be kind of a, a big sales space for them, but just never quite ended up turning out that way because of the Depression. They also owned 29 different textile mills in the South. They owned them in a, in a structure that was very similar to that of George Pullman, where um, people lived in the town where the mills were at, and they were paid in scrip instead of cash. Um, and the structure required that, that people live in these company towns. Now, the difference was um, George Pullman was a little, was a little more stingy with his employees. Marshall Fields realized that if I give them just a little bit more, um, people will be okay with this situation. So he ended up doing that. Um, Marshall Fields actually ended up becoming the president of Pullman after Pullman was ousted. Um, so he, he ended up taking over that business as well for a little while. Um, here is an image for the men's grill. So you can see that's very manly. Um, right across the street, yet another space just for, just for the guys. Um, this is an image of the wholesale um, location on Adams, Quincy, Franklin, and Fifth Avenue in Chicago. So it just it shows you what the building looks like and shows you an advertisement for that. Um, working at Marshall Fields, this is the part I hope, is there anyone who works in human resources? And nobody? Okay. If anyone, oh, one, one HR, oh, two H, okay, okay, wow, the HR people are not raising their hands proudly. Um, <laughs> Let's find out what kind of benefits Marshall Fields had for their employees. So first of all, by 1906, they had 12,000 permanent employees. Wow, that's a lot. Just, and remember, they only have their State Street store and the wholesale operation. They do not have the Oak Brook branch and the Woodfield branch, none of that for quite a long time. If you worked there, you could not eat or smoke tobacco in the store. I mean, okay, I guess we get that. You also couldn't gossip. I know, we'd all have to quit, right? <laughs> have you ever worked in a store where, or in any business where no gossip, where it just doesn't happen? I know, so I don't know how they enforce that rule, but that was in their, in their manual that you were not allowed to gossip in the store. Um, this was a place where women could work. Women did not have a lot of opportunities for working in the earliest periods, 1906, you know, right around the turn of the century, there weren't a lot of jobs for women. Um, women could potentially be teachers. They really weren't even secretaries yet. They could be domestics. Um, working in Marshall Fields was a place where women could work. Marshall Fields did not pay as much as other retail establishments, but it was Marshall Fields. So because it was Marshall Fields, people were willing to work there even though, even though it didn't pay quite as well. So what were some of the perks? The store had its own branch library. Now I will say, McHenry County College has a library. So, I mean, we're even so far. They also had a chorus. We do have a chorus. Not an employee chorus. An employee dining room. I think we got that. Um, they also had individual lockers for each employee. They had um, separate coat rooms. They had restrooms, lunchrooms. Um, they, they had a, a men's gym and a women's recreation area. Now this is the gender stuff in action. They did not have a place for women to work out, but women could, could have recreation space. So if you wanted to do scrapbooking or you know, needlepoint, that's where you would go. And men, you could lift weights. Um, so they had spaces like that for them. Um, in addition to that, they had an employee newspaper. That's pretty cool. They gave you vacation time, which was kind of unheard of back then. You got a week, or you got two weeks after you worked a year and every year thereafter. They also gave sick time. The sick time was based on private one-on-one -on -one arrangements, but Marshall Fields in many cases was very generous with sick time. He was, he was a person who would reward people who deserved being rewarded. Um, for example, the most he ever paid any of his managers, like even his vice presidents, the most you could make there when he was still alive, he died in 1906, but up through 1906, the most you could make was $6,000. That was it. Now, he was willing to pay you bonuses for really hard work, and there are people on record getting bonuses of like $30,000. But he just, that's the most I will pay you is $6,000. I'll give you bonus if your work warrants that, 
but I'm not giving you a raise beyond that, that cap. And he had a lot of very specific expectations like that. Um, so some other benefits, they had a company hospital, and they did actually, this, this hospital, it was not like a full service, they're going to take your appendix out kind of hospital, but they did have um, medical staff on, on site who would treat employees and um, also treat customers. So if you had a medical emergency, they had a hospital there. That's pretty cool. Um, in addition to that, they educated their cash boys. Now you may go, what's a cash boy? Um, in the very earliest period of Marshall Fields as a retail establishment, um, before they had those pneumatic um, tubes, you know, if you go to the, the bank, how they, those tubes. Well, Marshall Fields used those tubes once they became available, but before those were available, they actually had a group of boys um, young boys who would just sit and wait for somebody to go, cash boy, and then they would run over there and grab the money and get some change and bring it back. So if, if, if a particular cashier didn't have the change they needed, the cash boy would do the, the running. Um, and that was their whole job, was just running back and forth and changing money in. Um, typically, cash boys were not wealthy. That was a, a poor boy job. Um, but Marshall Fields made sure that these boys got educated, which was unique. Most of the time, no one really cared what happened to them, and Marshall Fields, the company, and Marshall Fields, the man, made sure that that education happened. They also, Marshall Fields, the man, set up, um, he set up an arrangement with Illinois Trust and Savings. He was on the board there, so he set up a deal where anybody who worked there could deposit money, even if it was a penny. You could deposit whatever amount of money you chose at 6% interest. How many of us would like that? I would like that deal now. Can you get me 6% interest on a savings account? Anybody? No, okay. <laughs> um, so he arranged that no matter how much you had to deposit, which because he knew that saving money was an important thing. He was Scottish, he believed in saving money, he wanted to make sure that, that people had that opportunity. Um, now we're gonna take it to some events in Chicago history that connect to Marshall Fields. So the first has to be the Chicago fire in 1871. Um, prior to this, Marshall Fields had a serious warehouse fire in 1870, so the Chicago fire was coming right on the heels of that. Um, the Great Chicago Fire killed 300 people, displaced 90,000 people. Marshall Fields themselves, they, had, um, they lost quite a bit of goods, but not as much as they could have. They actually, um, Levi Leiter, who still worked there, and Marshall Fields and some of their other top executives went to the store and they were able to throw some of the most expensive goods out the window to waiting wagons. And then they took the wagons to the train depot and sent the trains to Joliet. So they were able to evacuate about $200,000 worth of goods, um, which was great because that allowed them a starting point for reestablishing their business. Because the Great Chicago Fire happened in October, Christmas is coming, we need to get things up and running. So within a few weeks, they were able to open, and this is great, this is not where you think you'd go for Marshall Fields, but in the Chicago City Railway Company barn. They were in a barn is where they reopened Marshall Fields. A barn. Wow, right? Um, so they established the business there, um, and they were swamped. People needed to buy things because, of course, they had all had a fire. So Marshall Fields was incredibly busy in this barn location. Marshall Fields was also one of the only businesses in Chicago that met all its obligations. So most businesses after the fire, they were like, well, that's really too bad. We can't pay you. Sorry. We can't pay our debts. If, if we purchase goods from you, we can't pay those bills. Um, if we owe you money because you, you've worked for us, we're not paying you. Marshall Fields paid everybody, everything, because they were in a cash position. So um, that is pretty impressive. They also, in the aftermath of that, when they rebuilt the store, they decided to split wholesale and, where, and, um, wholesale and retail. Up until that point, they were in the same building. You know, like the first couple floors were retail and the last couple were wholesale. They split them. That's how big the store had gotten by that point. Here's an image of the before and after. You probably know which one is which. Um, so it just shows you how serious the fire was. Um, the entire building was obviously completely destroyed. Um, here's a sign that says cash boys um, and work girls will be paid what is due them Monday 9 a.m. October 16th and a location. So that's just a little illustration of how 
hard, Marshall Fields, the, the um, individual and the store worked to make sure that people were able to get what was owed to them. Um, they had another fire in 1877. Some, the story goes that some guy left a blowtorch on. Wouldn't you hate to be that guy? Um, overnight, left the blowtorch on and boom, the fire starts. So this time though, it didn't go as well as it did in the Great Chicago Fire. The Great Chicago Fire, they were able to evacuate most of their goods. Well, what ended up happening in this fire is, if you can imagine cooking Thanksgiving dinner with like 50 people in your kitchen, um, that's really what ended up happening. All sorts of people came running to Marshall Fields to help them um, take everything out of the store. So it was mass chaos. And all of a sudden, the, the very expensive lace is being thrown out the window and landing in the dirt. Um, and things are disappearing because there's so many people helping. And, and there's just, who's going where? What are we doing? Police officers were helping. Bystanders were helping. Employees were helping. It was just too many people all trying to evacuate at once. So it didn't go terribly well. Um, they did open very soon after in what is now the Art Institute of Chicago. The, it's, the building has changed, so it's not the same building, but it's that location. Um, what's funny, though, is that was considered a horrible, horrible location. If you remember the earliest days of the city, the, um, the lake was where you put all your garbage. If your horse died, you throw them in the lake. It, sorry, I know. Now you all want to go swimming, don't you? It's cold out. We don't want to go anyway. Um, but everything went in the, in the lake. Your garbage went in the lake. Any of your sewer, sewage went in the lake. Just everything went in the lake. The lake smelled horribly. So anything too close to the lake was ugh, no thank you. So it was not a good location. Today, people pay a lot of money to live by the lake. But back then, no, not at all. But that was where Marshall Fields ended up for a short period of time as they were rebuilding their State Street store. They ended up um, creating a shuttle service to take people back and forth to the store from, Mich uh, from um, State Street. Every five minutes they had a shuttle going to try to make it okay. And they did actually end up doing very well at that, state, at that location despite, the, despite what they had to deal with. Um, in the 1893 Columbian Exposition, the, the World's Fair, the White City, um, Marshall Fields played a role. Gordon Selfridge was around at that time, and Gordon Selfridge was all about display. So he is quoted as saying, I just love this quote, he wanted to dramatize their great store before the world to provide a special thrill on State Street for the thousands upon thousands of visitors expected for the fair. They must come, stare, and buy then go to their home speaking the wonders of Marshall Fields. And that was really what he made happen. So Marshall Fields put out this big splash and people were very much impressed by what they saw at Marshall Fields. Um, the men's annex, which was built by, um, designed by Daniel Burnham, opened during the World's Fair. So that was yet another thing for people to enjoy. Um, the Iroquois fire in, um, 1903, maybe you've heard this story, the Iroquois Theater, which was considered fireproof, we've heard that, right, with the whole unsinkable Titanic, kind of the same sort of story. It was, it was labeled as fireproof um, because they had this curtain for the stage that would come down in the case of any sort of fire and it would block the stage from the audience. The stage is normally what would be lit on fire because candles were there and, you know, all there was more activity on the stage. Well, um, this particular matinee um, started and the ushers wanted to go on break. So they needed to make sure that nobody snuck in the theater uninvited and without paying. So they locked the doors to make sure that nobody snuck in, which meant no one could leave. And unfortunately, the varnish that they used for all the wood in that theater was very flammable. So it, it blew up very quickly. Um, and within about 20 minutes, um, 571 people died. So it was a very, very fast fire. It, was, it still is the most deadly single building fire in US history, still, 120, almost 120 years later. So Marshall Fields became a destination for survivors. People came to that store because that was their store. That was a place that you would go in an emergency. So people came to Marshall Fields looking for bathrooms, looking for loved ones, looking for merchandise, anything that they, they might need if their clothes were damaged. Um, Marshall Fields themselves, they supplied emergency efforts. 
They provide clothing and blankets to wrap the dead. Um, and they also dispatch their delivery trucks from the warehouse. So whatever you need, we're throwing our store open to help you. Um, that was just how Marshall Fields did it. Um, here's a picture of the theater after the fire. I know black and white makes it a little tricky to see, but you can tell that's, that's not good. Um, so the San Francisco earthquake happened in 1906. That was the year that um, Marshall Fields, the man, died. Um, but Marshall Fields led the efforts. Chicago was the first location outside of San Francisco to provide aid to the earthquake victims. And Marshall Fields, the man, and the store, they led that effort. Um, I don't know why, it always makes me wonder. It's very specifically noted that they donated blankets and women's underwear. And I have seen that in about four or five different sources, women's under, like just women's underwear. And I don't, I don't quite know what to make of that, but okay, I put it in there because that's what it said. But yeah, uh, well, <laughs> and, I've, and no men's underwear, nothing for the men, just women. And no children's underwear either. Um, so don't think too hard about that. Um, the Eastland disaster in 1915 um, was another event where Marshall Field stepped in and helped. So if you haven't heard that story, the Eastland was a boat that had been retrofitted multiple times. It ended up being very, very top heavy. You have um, a group of Western Electric employees going to a company picnic. They are crowding into this boat. Most of them are on the top so they can all see and wave and the, all of that. And the boat tips over. It's still at dock, but it tips over. You can see it here tipped to the side. Um, when it tipped, many people were trapped in the boat. Um, also, this was a period where people didn't swim. Learning how to swim was not a thing people did. Um, most people were wearing wool. Wool is one of those fabrics that absorbs many times over its, its weight in water. So it becomes incredibly heavy. Women were wearing corsets, which is not conducive to swimming at all. Um, so people ended up dying in, in large numbers because of this. Some whole families ended up passing away. There were 844 people who died there. Fields provided blankets to cover the dead. Um, they opened their, their wholesale building once again. They also used um, drapery rods and cotton duck to help um, move the dead with uh, like stretchers. Um, and then finally, there were not enough, enough hearses to transport all the dead um, when they did the funerals because most of them happened on the same day. So Marshall Fields chipped in. They sent 39 of their delivery trucks to help deliver the caskets to funerals and move people um, to and from um, funerals. So Marshall Fields was really, they were very much dedicated to the success of Chicago as a city, not just their own profit. Um, this is an image from the 18, or 1934 World's Fair, which was held in Chicago. Um, and I love this, your keys to Chicago involve the World's Fair and Marshall Fields. And Marshall Fields, it says there that it is um, visit America's store. Marshall Fields and Company in gala attire. Um, so this was really a destination and people knew the name Marshall Fields by this point and would have wanted to make sure that they made it to the store. You don't go to Chicago without going to Marshall Fields. Marshall Fields, the man, donated $10 million and got donations of another $2.5 million for what became the Field Museum. This happened after the 1893 World's Fair. We had collected so much stuff, all this natural history. What do we do with it? What happened? So Marshall Field stepped up and he donated this money to start the museum. In addition to that, and I work at a college, so this next one is fun for me. Um, he was able to donate enough money to reopen the University of Chicago, which had been closed for 30 years because of financial problems. How much did he donate? $361,000, which if you work in higher ed, you know that today that would not happen. <laughs> so $361,000, but he was able to open the, the, um, open the school. Um, so he contributed in that way. Also, he was involved in the founding of the Art Institute, the Museum of Science and Industry, the Chicago Symphony, the Chicago Historical Society, um, combining the YMCA and the library. He also made donations in smaller amounts. He did not like it when people asked him for money. He hated that. But he was very much willing to donate when he decided he wanted to donate. 
So if you were somebody who needed money, like for, you know, you, you had a sad story about needing an operation or something, if you told him that you needed to borrow money, he wouldn't give it to you. But if he heard about the fact that you had this, this issue, he would, he would write a check. Um, he was very open to doing it at times when it wasn't demanded of him. Um, so I know we're in McHenry County and we have some feelings about taxes, right? I'm going to make us all feel better. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. So Marshall Fields, 110 years ago, was paying about half a million dollars in Cook County taxes. How many of us feel better now? Is anybody paying that in taxes now? No, see, it's not so bad. Um, so half a million dollars in Cook County taxes because he owned so much property. Um, he paid about $250,000 in taxes to other states as well. And remember, this is before income tax. Income tax didn't show up until 1913 and Marshall Fields died in 1906. So this is all real estate kind of taxes or, or taxes collected in another way. This is not income taxes. It is quite likely that Marshall Fields paid the most taxes of any man in the country. All the other robber barons, what they owned was not so real estate focused and real estate was the thing that was taxed. So it is quite likely that Marshall Fields paid the most taxes of anybody. Um, he owned $40 million worth of um, real estate, so I guess that's how that goes. Um, his son, Marshall Fields II, he died um, in an interesting way. Um, the story goes that he may have been at the Everly Sisters um, House of Ill Repute. That was the fanciest place of unsundry behavior um, in the city of Chicago. And um, he was a regular there. Marshall Fields II was kind of a ne'er-do-well. Um, his father worked hard for his money, and Marshall Fields II was, was not cut from the same cloth. Um, the official family story is that he ended up shooting himself while cleaning a rifle, but the way that he was shot was almost impossible that he could have actually shot himself. So the, the assumption is that he was over at the Everly Sisters um, and something unsundry happened and he was brought home. Um, the Everly Sisters was the first place that anyone drank champagne out of a, out of a woman's slipper. So, I mean, it was, it was a happening sort of place. Um, Marshall Fields II ended up dying. Um, a couple days later, his, fa um, his father, Marshall Fields, was a broken man and died just a couple months after that, after playing golf with um, Robert Todd Lincoln. Robert Todd Lincoln shows up for a lot of people's deaths. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, so a couple presidents, too, he ended up showing up for. But anyway, um, so Marshall Fields ended up dying. Mar um, John G. Shedd ended up taking over as the second president of Marshall Fields, and the story continues. Um, so we continue to see protests in November. This is protest month. Um, Marshall Fields was sold for the last time to Macy's, and Macy's chose to change the name in 2006. So think, think about the fact that here we are 15 years later, still talking about it, still wishing we had the... the forest green bags back and all that Marshall Fields stuff. So it really does say something about what Marshall Fields contributed to the city of Chicago, to us, to our families, um, Christmas ornaments and, and going to the Walnut Room for holidays and all those other family events that, that were centered around Marshall Fields have, have definitely left an indelible mark um, such that people are willing to protest in November downtown. I mean, I would maybe protest in April. Um, November is not a good month for a protest, and they're willing to do that in November. So um, let me just ask if anyone has any questions before we go. Yes. How he paid for it or how? Um, I vaguely remember the story. It's, it's one of those. He didn't originally want his name on the building. Um, and the Field Museum was not in the museum campus where it is now. It was, it was relocated at a, at a period of time. Um, I think they were originally going to call it the Chicago um, Natural History Museum. I don't think they named it the Field Museum until after he was dead. Do you, do you know? Okay, then that's the truth. Um, <laughs> I think that's it. So, but uh, notice I said thanks, so that, that gives me some wiggle room. Yeah, Jean. Sarah, um, you said at the beginning you said it was Fields and Lincoln. Yes. 
Oh, this is a good, a good story I didn't have time to tell you. So um, this, I usually do this as about a two hour talk, hour and a half, and I thought, oh, 45 minutes, this is gonna be tough. So um, Levi Leiter was the, the partner who handled all the money, um, but he was kind of a jerk. He was not very nice to customers. He was kind of a curmudgeon. And um, Marshall Fields got to the point where he had just had it. So he decided to buy Levi Leiter out. But he set up this deal where, where he offered to let Levi buy him out. So he let Levi set the price, which, you know, Levi only had so much money. So he set a lower price than what it might have been. Um, and then in the meantime, Marshall Fields went and talked to all the other um, executives and got them to be partners with him. So he was actually able to come up with the cash to buy out Levi. Levi was rather shocked by this. Um, so Levi Leiter was bought out for, in 2012 money, are you ready for this? Half a billion dollars, 500,000, which let's think about that for a minute. If you could buy half of a store for half a billion dollars, what does that say about how much you have and how much the store is worth, right? So obviously the store was worth at least a billion dollars of today's money back then. So it's just for, for scope. Um, Levi Leiter ended up moving to Lake Geneva. His son um, spent most of the money on um, speculating on, on futures. And his daughter, interestingly enough, was one of the first um, debutantes to go over to England to buy into an aristocratic family and get the title. She was in the first wave of that. And um, the man she married, they weren't very happy together, but eventually they fell in love later and all that. Um, but anyway, he became the, um, the administrator in um, um, India. The, the emperor of India, and she became the number two ranked woman in England next to Queen Victoria. So there you go. Yes, that was worth the price of admission right there. Yes, did you have a question? How did it get sold? I mean, it just kept going and going and going. Right. Well, it was sold a couple times. Um, it was sold to an English um, firm, B, B, A, Bat, something like that. And then it was sold to Dayton Hudson, which then became Target because Target is where they were making their money. Um, and then it ended up being sold to Macy. So the problem is that um, the department store model was not able to compete with today's shopping. You know, we don't have all day to go to, to you know, shop. We just don't. And... Um, the fact that, that the internet showed up meant we could price shop things. We didn't always have to spend as much money. And the business model just wasn't as competitive. Um, the Marshall Fields family sold out of Marshall Fields pretty early. By the mid, um, certainly by the 1950s, they had no stake in the, in the store at all. Um, they, they were invested in other things. So um, it really wasn't Marshall Fields exactly by that point. Um, so that's how that happened. Other questions? Yes. Oh. You were what? Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yes, including, was it, was it Hedy Lamar? It, there was one famous celebrity who went on to be like, you know, somebody in Hollywood. Was it Hedy Lamar? Okay. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, isn't that great? Yeah, that's terrific. All right, Mary. I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe money. Marshall feels like money. Um, I don't, honestly, I don't know. I didn't read anything that talked about that. Marshall Fields was not, he himself was not a man that, that spoke very much. Um, he was a very um, taciturn, serious Scottish man. Um, and most of the information that I found was, was very propagandized. Um, but nothing specific about the, the color, so I don't, I don't know. So all of us should make something up and then leave and say that's what it is. So, yes? At what point in their history did they open up the suburban branches? 
Um, the suburban branches were basically in the, the 60s. I think that was when the first couple opened up and they continued from there. By then, people had started to move out of the city of Chicago, so it made sense to, to put the stores where the people were moving. You were, but Oak Park was earlier, maybe in the 50s, the late 40s, something in there. Okay. Okay. So, other questions? Yes, Bev. If someone else is trying on the clothes, how do you get it? It would be tailored. Most everything back then was tailored in some way. Um, so it was, it was ready to wear ish. Um, they didn't have sizes like we have today. Um, and, and today we don't even have sizes like we have today because, you know, an eight could be that or that. Um, but they, yeah, they, they mostly did tailoring. Everything was tailored. And that was usually complimentary, which was a really nice way of handling things. Other questions? Yes. They actually were not the first to sell the Frango Mint. Um, Marshall Fields bought a department store chain out of the West Coast um, in Oregon and Washington, and that is where Frangos originated. When they bought that department store, they brought the manufacturing of Frangos to Chicago, and that's where they made it, but they weren't the first. Um, and the name came from that department store. It, the department store was... Um, can't remember the name off the top of my head, but like like Franklin, and it, it fit with Frango. Frango made made it make sense. So yeah. Other questions? Yes. a lot of things. <laughs> I think there is. I think the dilemma is, um, can we, are we willing to pay for it? There are people who are willing to pay for that extra service, and there are some, some people who aren't. Are there enough people willing to pay for it that it would be cost effective? Yeah, unfortunately, we love the service, but we don't like to pay for it anymore. So it, it's interesting. Um, I'd like to think that it, it could work. And there are some stores that are certainly very high end that, that have a lot of customer service and they do really well. So it's possible, but a store of that size would be tricky. It would be hard. It's such a beautiful romantic. Oh, it's gorgeous, isn't it? It totally is. And I would like it if someone would give me $50 million and then I would think about maybe opening Marshall Fields again. <laughs> So if anyone's willing to do that, you let me know. Other questions? All right, so um, now that we've answered all the questions, on behalf of McHenry County College and the foundation who sponsored this event, I want to thank you for coming here tonight. I hope you enjoyed your time here at MCC, and I hope we see you again in February when our own Christine Grella does the next um, Faculty Speaker Series event. Thank you for coming. <laughs>